All right, folks, we are doing the best of UK black metal today. And who better to do it with? It's Chris from Winterfilth, one of our absolute favorites. Dude, you got a brand new album out. How's it going? How What's the reception been so far? It's been great, thanks. Probably one of the best receptions I think we've ever had to an album, which is which is very promising when you've been away for four years. So yeah, I'm really happy with it. The album's called The Imperious Horizon, if people aren't familiar with it. You got to show the physical, man. It's got a cool vinyl version with this kind of like mint yoke thing. Cool snowy um, Imperious Horizon. It's even got like an embossed logo thing, which is rather cool. Nice. Yeah, so it's, it's our it's our eighth album. Just came out on Candlelight's Spy Farm Records. So uh, yeah, I really like encourage people to try and check it out. You know, if you've, if you've heard of the band before, which hopefully you have now after nearly 20 years, and if you haven't, well, shame on you. You should have. So uh, <laughs> so check it out. Like, you know, we're, I, th I think it's a great album. We really put a lot into this one. So um, I'm hoping that it resonates with people and they, they feel the same. Let's throw it over to you and talk about one of your first UK black metal band picks. To be honest, there's a lot of great bands that have come out of the UK in recent years. I think, you know, when we started as a band, probably sort of 2006, maybe, there wasn't that much UK black metal at the time, really. And there'd been this kind of weird gap in the market as well, you know, from that kind of mid, late 90s right through to the sort of early 2006, you know, and you guys were probably around then, you know, it was, it was kind of more in that, obviously new metal was becoming a thing. There was that whole sort of sludge, Carnate, Sun, Southern Lord, Isis, Hydrahead Records, mm -hmm. Doom thing that was going on for a long while there. So there's a real gap in black metal. And then I think when we started sort of 2006, there's a, there's a handful of bands that started around then. And um, I guess the first pick that I had was, was one of those bands, um, or, their, or it's their most recent album. Our friends of the band Fen, I don't know if you know those guys. Love fan. So this is their newest album, which is called Monuments to Absence. A really great album. You know, um, I really love the track Racked on this one, which is on the, 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 the final side of it, track side D. But that's a really great one. And Fen have been one of those... I guess, enduring great bands who've been around almost as long as us, who've a different take on the whole thing. You know, they've a little bit more post-metal at points. It's sort of a, a more, a little bit slower and considered at points, and they kind of have a bit more of a vastness. Their outlook is of the sort of the fens, which is a kind of like an area of kind of quite flat. I did not know that natural land kind of over where they're from a little bit more of a sort of language sound to them you know it's like kind of building and brooding and layered and kind of interesting and so i i, I definitely encourage people to check them out and they've been one of those like i say one of those enduring bands that's very much been around since since we started and they've uh, they've been doing a, a load of great albums so i, I mean I, I recommend the newest one i think it's one of the better ones They actually did it with our mutual producer friend, Chris Fielding, as well, at the controls. And I think it's one of their um, biggest sounding albums as well. And I think they've just kind of gone on this, kind of, this, this organic growth curve of just things getting better and sounding better. So I would recommend that new one off the bat. I feel like Fen deserves a lot more recognition. They don't really get talked about as much as they should. I think they're one of the probably four or five most important black metal bands from the UK, certainly since the beginning of the 2000s. Your band has always had this sort of distinct approach to your songwriting, weaving those like furious and melodic sounds, especially on the latest release. I feel like you're leading more into furious sides. What is it like for you and the band being that core winter felleth sound that you've carried over the years? And how did you like explore that new ferocious kind of sound on the new record? I suppose in my mind that there, there does have to be this kind of idea of what a winter felleth album is, or uh, at least some kind of like, I don't know, reverence paid to the idea of the sort of sound of the band, but also you, you do kind of want to do new things with it, I think. You do want to push it into new territory. So um, Mark, who's our kind of fairly long-term keyboard player, he did a lot more keys on this record than we have done in, in the past, which I think is a really interesting dynamic to it. It opens the, opens the sound up a little bit, I think. <laughs> Particularly with after the complexity of mixing it. It sits in some really nice areas around the other instruments, and I think it adds a, a new dynamism to the sound, which is um, which is refreshing, I think, if you're a fan of all the other albums. And, and it just sort of keeps the atmosphere growing, I think, album to album. 
But I think we had a little bit more of a ferocious guitar tone this time. Like, I, I, I did a deal with these guys who like live near us, who make these cool boutique effects pedals. Oh, wow. Whoa. Yeah, they made these pedals for me, like Green Cathedral, which is like named after our track of the same name. So this company, Technovolt, that we did some work with, they, they, I, no, it wasn't this pedal specifically, actually. We used this other one they have, which is called a uh, transistor trunk. And it's a kind of like EQ pedal type thing. And so it's got a bit more fizz at the top end of it. It's got a bit more bite on the top of it. And I think that really helps with the sort of more tacky edge of some of the more metal, black metal sounding stuff. And just, I don't know, just think we got better. We got a new guitar player and Russell joined the band. We had four years this time in between albums, I guess, because of COVID and all the sort of weirdness that happened therein. Yeah. We just kind of pushed ourselves to write as the best stuff that we could. And I think we really self-edited and just pushed ourselves into a few new corners. So obviously like the black and roll track on this one, a bit of a do me a long one. So there's all sorts of kind of twists and turns around the, the core winter for the sound, I think. Let's get to your second pick for favorite UK black metal. Another band who were probably very formative in the similar kind of era to us, which is, I think, who were, again, were one of the most important bands of the sort of newer era. Oh, I love that record. And so this is their album. This is their second album, which is called Curse. There's some really great moments in this, but I um, I have a particular favorite, which is the last track, which is called The Name of the Wind. I think that's a really brilliant track. Even though it's kind of one of the more slower, it was really sort of a, a good kind of inspiration for us doing tracks like Green Cathedral or even in Silent Grace. You know, those kind of tracks are really, so show a really strong side of their writing. And they've kind of ended too soon. And it was a real shame, I think, because of just what happened in their, their lives as guys and stuff like that. So I, I'm sad that they didn't make more records because they were always brilliant. That just makes that record more special then. It does. And they, they came out with this new band. The other guys, the drummer and the bassist and one of the guitar players and the keys player, I think. They did a, another band called Nemerus, which um, had a had a sense of that World and Swim material. They only did an EP so far, so I don't think they fully realized exactly what that's going to be yet. But it, it was really promising and perhaps a, a little bit of a foot in for them kind of reclaiming some of that status they had in World and Swim. You guys unexpectedly have this amazing collaboration with a uh, primordial vocalist, Alan. His voice takes, you know, the music, that core winter fill of sound to like another place. Did you have him in mind for that song? What was the process like for collaborating with him? Well, I mean, he's he's been a friend of ours for a long time. If you followed the bands, you know, we've done some done some touring together over the years and, and we've gone over to Ireland to support them at some of these kind of big uh, international festivals that they've kind of organized in, in Ireland. You know, they've brought over bands from all over the place. So that's been really cool. And so we got to know Alan uh, quite well. And then on our last album tour, well, I guess when we probably last spoke to you guys, we had probably a year after we spoke to you was the first time we could do shows, you know, after all the COVID and everything. So we had a few cancellations because some of the bands from overseas couldn't make it. We had Mark trying to come over and Yuada trying to come over and Panopticon trying to come over and it was all just kind of a nightmare. So we opted, um, to ask Alan's other band, Dread Sovereign. I don't know if you're aware of. I love that band. You, you spend loads of time with guys in the van, and you you know you find out you have even more in common than you thought, and blah blah blah. So you know we were writing this record. We had the idea for this song from the previous record, but we really fleshed it out on this one. And I guess you know you sort of sit here in your writing studio uh, in my space in my house, and um, myself and Nick were kind of putting that track together. And one of us, maybe myself or maybe Nick, I can't really remember, just started singing a kind of like a, a melody line, almost like nonsense lyrics that just kind of you could feel the sort of how it would fit over what we're doing. And we both, I think we're both just going, this just sounds like Alan should sing on this. And it's like, <laughs> I could do a good version of it. I think I can sing okay. Like Mark, who's our keys player, is a good singer as well. He could probably do okay. But we were just like, Alan's our friend. Why don't we just ask Alan? <laughs> So yeah, he sang on the record, and I think I know you guys love a bit more of the Doom stuff as well. And I think that that track is is a is a really interesting sort of blend of I guess the the more atmospheric elements of the Winter Filler sound that maybe kind of push into some of that more like repetitive, transcendental, older school of of black metal. Yeah. 
But also, I think it leans a bit more into the kind of, you know, where I come from, the sort of peaceful doom type stuff, you know, the kind of anathema in My Dying Bride and like some of that stuff and it has a bit of a doomier edge to it. And then Alan's sort of well-versed in singing over that more morose sounding stuff, particularly if you've listened to any of those recent primordial albums that are a bit more kind of in the introvert and sort of more languid sounding stuff at points as well. And so, which I don't know, just became this kind of triumphant centerpiece of the album that I don't think any of us were expecting would be greater than the sum of its parts so i'm happy that it's kind of been setting people alight and um i guess we have to play it now which is the more complicated thing uh, you guys just announced an ireland tour so are, are we expecting alan maybe to jump on stage with you guys or i mean it it definitely needs a conversation i haven't had one with him yet but i think we 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 need to try and figure that out it feels daft to not do that song with alan being in ireland given that the first date is in dublin and that's where he lives so <laughs> I'm sure we'll try and figure something out. Yeah, come on. Hoping he can remember an 11 minute song by the time we get there in four or five months' time. So we'll see. But yeah, I think it has to happen. And I think um, it would be daft of us not to, to try and do that for the fans who obviously really want to hear that track now. So let's get to your next pick. So I've gone with another great band from the UK, as we're talking about that, who are called Ninkasag. I don't know if you know those guys. That is a really good record. That came out, what, 2021 or 22? I don't know, actually. Let me find it. It was on Vendetta Records, this one. Yeah. Oh, trust it's been Roman numerals. Yeah, I think it, I think it's a few <laughs> years old now. But it's called The Dread March of Solemn Gods. And I think it's a really great one. So yeah, they've got this kind of like slightly dissection-y thing going on on the cover, which I, which I love. And it's a bit of a homage to that kind of bluey cover of the sort of dissection on that side Eclipse album. They've got a bit of that about them musically, but there's a real sort of traditional black metal vibe to it, but more on that kind of how like dissection had an edge on that almost. Like it, it's not just sort of straight up. There's like bits that sort of chop around and stuff and they're really kind of talented songwriters. And, uh, and Kyle, the main guy behind the band is a, you know, a really great songwriter as well. So I would definitely recommend people check that one out. They have another album before that as well. And, uh, and a couple of like, seven inches and stuff but i think that was my my favorite of their albums i love that you've got some of the little lesser appreciated gems on the list that's awesome that's exactly what i want to bring to people's attention that's what the whole channel is about really i think it's hard with these kind of things because there, to my <laughs> mind there's this kind of group of like five or six bands that were sort of the the bands that kind of took took up the mantle if you like um in the sort of early 2000s there was a few bands obviously from before that like the cradle of filth and kind of balsagoths and hikatian thrones and there was even bands like you know anal nathrak and code and the axes of perdition and stuff but a lot of that stuff is kind of like industrial almost grindy mm -hmm. it's great british extreme metal i'm not sure if it's exactly black metal or not and so um i i guess perhaps this is my own definition and those guys will, will will spit at me for saying that or whatever but like i think they're great extreme metal bands i'm just not sure if they're in my kind of definition of black metal yeah that's fine i kind of i've mentioned them with love but i don't think they exactly would fit into this this piece but uh, they are some great bands that kind of came along after that as well and i think even latterly we're seeing tons and tons of great bands that labels like candlelight and vendetta and others have sort of been supporting and you've been doing a great job you know writing up some articles about some of these bands it's really awesome that you're that you're giving back in that way thanks I I, I do think, uh, you know, I know it's cheesy, but I do think a rising tide raises all ships in a sense. And I, by this point, you know, we're almost 20 years into being a band. I'm fairly sure that we've proven what we have to prove to people by now. And if, and if we haven't, then God knows what else we can do. <laughs> I'm happy that we can just help bands that we like and people that we think are deserving to get, you know, that foot up or whatever that they need. And, and I've always had a, a, a mantra of sort of like being the person that I needed when I was in that situation. And I've definitely tried to help people who, who need it with their, with their band and stuff. Cause it's hard enough to get heard through the sea of 50 major releases every week. Never mind trying to get out of your local scene and, and all that sort of stuff. So um, if you're great and we can help you, then, you know, I, I've tried my best to. I love that, man. And if you're shit, then best and out of luck. Yeah, and best of luck to you again. <laughs> if you're shit, then you have to pay me to pretend. <laughs> So 
So back to the Imperious Horizon, I think we noticed that it feels incredibly episodic in a lot of ways, mainly due to not only the pacing, but also how it's separated by some of the compositions and the long droning sections and even some of the style differences. Your band has always utilized instrumentals in a brilliant way, but also composed things very purposely. Can you talk about how you put together this episodic feel of the record? You have to keep in mind the idea of what you sound like as a band and sort of refer back to that a little bit at points and obviously you develop a style of how you play and kind of how you write and i think you know i read some of the things that some people say sometimes and you think well oh they're just repeating themselves or whatever but i think maybe they missed the point there. there there is a kind of a style and an essence to a winter for the album that is i guess a core of a sound but also we do like quite a lot of interesting different things within that i just think people don't dig in enough to notice the sort of nuances that are sort of sat around that you know if you look at this new record there's huge big kind of epic building moments and i guess we've always had this idea of things kind of building to a climax at the end and there being this really big payoff and they're you know i, I guess a mighty or a heroic or a, an atmospheric moment kind of really landing on top of all the ones you've built on the way there. I suppose one of the main things really about our, our style is just writing stuff in layers and kind of building on things and kind of even if you kind of got quite a repetitive underlying riff it's sort of every few reps kind of building something into that so the, the song keeps moving forward and there, there's kind of new shapes you know forming on top of that. So I think we've we sort of dug into that a lot. What's helped also in this album is that we've got five guys writing this time. Mark, having now done his art project, um, Prophecy, you know, he's he's been doing a lot more kind of original guitar compositions type stuff. So he, he's he been a lot more forthcoming with, with ideas. Like he's wrote a lot on all the albums, but I mean, he would always like build on the stuff that's kind of been written and come up with cool parts around that or suggest things on top of it. Whereas this time he was bringing kind of underlying tracks and, and you know, other things like that. Russell, who's our new guitar player as well, of Necronautical, if you know them as well, mm -hmm. so on Candlelight. He's a different player than myself and Nick, who I guess we're always the kind of core writers to an extent. And even to Dan, who was our previous lead guitar player, and Mark, who was our lead guitar player before Dan. Those guys have always been a really good foil to me and Nick, because I think me and Nick write a certain way and kind of have this sort of the sound. And so it's good to have a, another guy in your band that doesn't think like you. And so I guess, you know, the, the way you sort of described it, it's been great because there hasn't been like, lo like long pauses in the writing. It's like, right, I've got these two riffs what comes now oh well nick oh my head goes here or oh, russell what why was it go there my head goes over here oh right okay well maybe let's follow a few of those paths sometimes right hmm. always going the way that you might um instinctively think to go so I, I think all that's just combined you know we had a lot more time this album we had a bit more better budget this time i think the material just had the the vastness and the atmosphere that we wanted and um, through no small effort of lots of mixers and lots of masters and my um, probably driving Chris Fielding to distraction, uh, we, we kind of got where we got to. And so um, I think that bears out in the final thing. Yeah, it definitely came through. That's for sure. I thought I'd mention it just because he's our new guitar player, but also because it's actually a great record as well. So Russell, our new guitar player, uh, or newest guitar player, he's been in the band for four years now. This is their most recent album. They're working on new at the minute, but this is their, their latest album, Slain in the Spirit. Nice. Cool sort of David Thierry cover. I guess they're a little bit more sort of hyper blast than Winter for the Thar. It's, it's, it's a lot more aggressive black metal and it's quite, um, a few like operatic moments in it and a bit more kind of on the sort of symphonic keys parts at times. But, but Russ is a really great writer and a very technical player, actually. Like when you consider our styles together, I have a much more sweeping style than he does. And he's got a really attacky, like single string jumping across the strings, very sort mm. of traditional black metal style. And it, he's, he's got some really interesting riffs. There's some really interesting moments. There's a great song called Necro Psychonautics, which they made a video for. There's loads of great songs on it. Hypnagogia is a great song as well. And um, Ritual and Recursion is a really great song too. So um, have a listen, see what you think. Yeah. 
you talked a bit about uh, Mark and how he has brought a little bit more to the table this time, and it really shows. I think some of our favorite elements of this album are those keyboard and synth sections that really kind of take you on that journey. Were there any particular challenges, or did you guys just kind of fall lockstep in, in the writing process? I think the writing process was fairly straightforward. I mean, I'm, sh I'm sure I'm maybe like looking at it with rose tinted glasses. <laughs> But um, there may have been a few moments we disagreed, but it, it definitely hasn't been like it has been on previous albums. It came together quite naturally, I think. The, the difficulty was in mixing what we were trying to do. Uh -huh. And obviously you guys are audio guys, so you know what, what happens with records. You know, the, you think of the sort of the spectrum of the sound. All the guitars are in that kind of 3 or 4K range. All the vocals are also in that range. Also, all the cymbals are in that range, and the snare drum in parts, and whatever else you're trying to do with screen vocals and layers and lead guitars. And so it's all in this really narrow range. And so we really did a, um, a huge job with, um, with our friend, Mark Minot, who's the guy that mastered it. He's a, he's a lecturer at Huddersfield uni near where, um, where we're from, uh, where I'm from originally. And he, um, he does a lot of like sound engineering stuff. He did like the last few, my dying bride records. He does some rotten Christ records and he's a, uh, he's a really kind of skilled engineer. So I kind of went to him and was like, look, we're sort of struggling to find room for all this stuff. Like, what do you suggest? Um, cause he, you know, he's dealing with like all sorts of mixes all the time. Cause he, um, you know, he deals with like students who are mixing all kinds of stuff, but also he's on this kind of research project, which is really interesting. That's looking at like, like trying to define heaviness in a, in a broad huh. sense. Wow. And so he's been speaking to all these producers from around the world, like people like Jens Bogren and like, um, oh, I forget. A few, a few of the ones he's spoken to, but like some quite big guys who've done some, oh, he's spoken to like Andy Sneap, I think, and people like that, some really kind of interesting producers. And so he had some really interesting, um, I guess, advice to give and some sort of stuff he learned from his travels, if you like, speaking to those guys about where you can put certain instruments or where you can boost certain frequencies that you wouldn't think would help, but that do. Hmm. And so we went through this really interesting process of finding like the kind of 7K range for the keys, the sort of 8, 16K range for the keys, like taking some of the, the, the kick out at certain frequencies and moving up in others so you can like make room for the the low end of the bass, but like you still get the punch of the kick and stuff around it. Wow. It was like more of a conversation for the kind of audio nerd side of us all than perhaps for a, you know. Yeah, that's a separate conversation. <laughs> yeah. it, it really helps us to get there. So the difficult part was mixing all the key stuff that, that happened really, because it was, we didn't want it to be like a symphonic Winter Phillip album. It's Winter Phillip with keys. Yeah. It's, it's not like Dimmer Ball Gear or something like that, where it's like really upfront wall of keys sort of thing. So it was a really fine balance. But I think those things, like you say, you know, they really added to the, um, the whole atmosphere of the thing. And it, and it really gave Mark the chance to sort of pull a few layers out of that stuff and sort of build some counter melodies around some of the stuff we're doing. And even so, even though some of it's quite subtle at points, I think this is kind of my um, frustration with people who are maybe like listening to it three times and then giving it a review. It's like, you really need to kind of sort of seek the magic in there um, once you're kind of used to the structure of the song. I'm picking things out every listen. I was just listening to it actually on my way to work this morning. And there are parts where like the guitar is in the front, but he's following like the little melody that's underneath the chord structures. That just makes the chords pop out even more and have more drama to them. I, I love it. I think you guys really nailed bringing that into the mix. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, it was, uh, like I say, it was it was no uh, mean feat to try and make it all work. And I was really keen that we did because I knew there was room for everything. But when you're making these really multi-layered, dense walls of sound in terms of guitars and leads and vocals and everything, you have to kind of, I guess, find that um, where everything sits. Otherwise, you just end up with this like sonic assault of not the right stuff. And you lose the essence of the, the nuance and the melody and stuff in those tracks as a producer you got to find those magic ranges of where the music wants to sit too you know like sometimes the magic of those guitars ends up being higher up in the range that you wouldn't expect it's fun to play with those knobs and make it work you really did nail it it sounds like you're in the album cover i'm, I'm glad yeah I, I think that was a it's such an evocative image that that snowy vista and i just think that it it totally summed up where we were at in terms of the kind of the concept of the album and the sort of shrouded in mist and just beyond the horizon kind of concepts that sort of sit within it and it, it really um it, it was really one of those images that jumped out and we were like well yeah of course it's that image you know this is just the one that i picked out of the of the shelf but there's there's several other great records by this band but i think it would be remiss yes. of me not to mention say so. fantastic band <laughs> Thank you.
Andy's a great friend of mine and he's one of the earliest supporters of Winterfell and we've we've kind of known each other forever since he was doing bands like Ascaval and Falloch and all the stuff he kind of did before this so earlier incarnations of Sayor really Arsai before he renamed it to Sayor and all this sort of stuff so we've been friends for a long time and um, it, it's an interesting one with Andy you know he um, he's really taken off with this band now and he's like kind of doing it touring every weekend and you know like doing a lot of festival shows and stuff around his around his life and I think I'm really glad that like he's he's kind of managed to do that with the band he has a lot of like session players and stuff it's mainly a sort of solo project but they've become a really important band on the sort of British but also kind of international and European scene and I well, this is the album Roots which I think is a really great one but um, there are lots of other great ones that he's done as well you know um, I think he's he's also kind of on the precipice of doing a new one which he sent me which I probably can't talk about so we won't but um, there's a new one coming very soon that he's also done with our good friend Chris Fielding and I am um, very heartened that it sounds absolutely fantastic so awesome. coming out this, this next few months maybe next year at some point we're excited for that Talked a little bit about the uh, the album cover. The whole album has that icy theme to it. Was the album cover the initial thing, or did you go into it writing and then you said this is matches what we're doing? Can you just talk about overall what the Imperious Horizon really is to you? The title was the first thing that I came up with. I do. I always like to have a, a title and a sort of broad concept in mind when I'm writing stuff. I just think it helps to focus you on a, on a sort of end point for it all. The title. Um, without being too deep about it is I guess it's just about the sort of like the sneering evil controlling nature of the sort of power structures that exist in society and so um, well it's a metal record full of great riffs and you know hopefully some moments that sort of give you goosebumps and kind of encourage you know the the kind of metal head in you there is a sort of uh, i guess a more serious tone behind it in the sense of imperious is a kind of a term that means i guess like dominating controlling yeah. sneering scheming kind of thing and I, I suppose i mean that from multiple angles you know people governments corporations whatever it is at the sort of top of the tree who are kind of designing the way things become and sort of chipping away at people's freedoms a little bit and i, I think that happens on many fronts all the time uh, and if we had two hours to go into it we could probably go into the minutiae of where all that's coming from you know, just the worrying stuff like people talking about like digital currency, moving people away from like finances, everyone's financial lives and everything being kind of electronic and the worry that comes with the security and the free, the personal freedoms of all those things or our government talking about national service. Well, why would you have that if you weren't thinking about going to war, blah, 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 all these kind of things that happen. Everyone's uh, energy prices going up, food prices going up, people unable to live, people having to go to food banks, like whatever it is, all these kind of things that are happening all the time on many levels. I, it feels like there's some design behind that when you've got companies talking about hundreds of billions of, of pounds or dollars worth of profit and you know having to put prices up because you know there, there's been some nonsense issue in our supply chain or whatever oh has there and all of a sudden you just managed to make 200 billion out of that of you okay so it was a really big problem i guess so there's all these kind of things that sort of go on and i guess like when you think about horizons in society horizons are there's an army coming over that horizon the sun's going to rise over that horizon there's something just out of sight over that horizon and so i guess with that in mind when i saw that image which i can show again if you like of that kind of like foggy sort of atmosphere around a, you know the, the peak of a hill and you can't quite see what's on the other side it sort of framed that idea for me a little bit and i guess um you know thanks for coming to my ted talk wherever the serious bit aside that that was kind of the, the kind of galvanizing force for um where my head was at with the concept and so the tracks kind of stack up to that but it's about that shrouded in mist veiled in sort of secrecy what's going on at a sort of top line level pretty deep for a black metal record i love it yeah <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, unfortunately, this is not the uh, you know the slam gore grind album that you know everyone was hoping it would be. There is actually meaning to it, and we're not talking about like you know splattering people's guts all over the, the street or something. That stuff has its place too. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, maybe, but yeah. <laughs> And my final pick, which um, which for another great band from Manchester, actually, um, where we are from, is the band Woad. I don't know if you know Woad. Oh, I love that record. I didn't realize that they were from Manchester. This is Burning Many Mirrors by Woad, which is their, their most recent, I think, but it's still a really great album. The track Lunar Madness is a really great one. They've got loads of great records, two or three others, I think, as well, but the production on this one, the sort of ferocity of the songs, how quick they are in terms of, like, getting to some 
cool hooks and melodies and they just have a, a totally unique sound and they also have loads of other bands as well aggressive perfecter and um, some of them are involved in a band called heavy sentence which is really cool too so um, there's all these kind of offshoots from all these bands so um, there's a whole rabbit hole to go down and like i was saying when we first started in kind of the 2006 ish it's funny there was probably like seven or eight bands doing something of meaning around then a forest of stars and fan and scaldic curse and see and earlier incarnations and world and so on and stuff and now i think there's probably like 500 bands from the uk so i don't even know them all and i and i still come across new ones all the time and then there's this whole sort of sub genre which i'm yet to kind of get fully into of this kind of more like raw stuff and all these guys just doing limited to 50 kind of cassettes and cds and stuff so oh nice a whole other there's a whole other sub subterranean layer of uk black metal which even i am yet to to permeate we'll have to do a marathon of that stuff someday but <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> i'm not sure if we, i'm not sure if we've all got time for everyone right. so. <laughs> yeah, probably not no that demo so um, I, i'll leave it to the guys that are into it thank you so much for going through all this with us chris talk about where people can find the imperious horizon i'm hoping that you can get the, the album in all the relevant sort of stores in the particularly in the us candlelight and spine farm have a have a us store um based out of new york so you should be able to get it really easily even places like amazon hold you know have it in place like that so most 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 people have access to that with the free shipping which i would obviously recommend given how much it costs to ship records then and then we've just got some tour dates coming up so um if you're from the uk or europe watching this then the fourth to the 10th of november uh we're out in the uk um and scotland with worm witch from canada they're a great band on profound law and then a, a band called Bizarre Cult, who are a kind of progressive uh, black metal band from Norway, who are on Season of Mist. So uh, some really cool guys and some really sort of variation in the band, which I think would be interesting, even though there's a sort of galvanizing theme with everybody. And then, like you mentioned before, uh, Jan 31st, Feb 1st, Feb 2nd, 2025, we're over in Ireland. So um, we'll see if we can drag Alan along for a uh, sing-along. And then... Uh, Hopefully a few pints. Pressure's on, Alan. You heard it here. <laughs> All right, folks, check out the Imperious Horizon. Links will be down in the description below. Go with the gods, Forge Mates. The Horizon is watching.